those blue stripes go well with you. Are they blue? <laughs> they go well with your red tie. I've already been told. <laughs> well, good morning. How are you today? They make fun of my good Good morning. You're making fun of my blue striped shirt. Okay. <laughs> what if it was purple? Uh, yeah. Seem to stick for them guys. There's a lot of ways to get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's pure that has in the front. You see? What? You can probably get it. Really pleasant thing. Mine was for Chell just a couple minutes ago. Oh. <laughs> Stay. Stay. How are you today? Watch this guy here. Trouble, trouble, trouble. <laughs> he won't flip you. He's <laughs> Started in the morning. I'd rather have Jesus. Than anything. Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have all of you with us today, except Jerry. And uh, <laughs> uh, good to have you with us this morning. What a great day this is. How many of you saw the sunset last night? Did anybody get a chance to see the sunset? Did you see it? Man, that was beautiful. My mom texted me and she said, "I wish you could see colors." And uh, good morning, sir. And uh, she said, I wish you could see colors. And I said, well, what I can see is beautiful. She said, well, if you could see colors, it's so much better. And I said, okay, well, in heaven, I'll be able to see colors. Or maybe in heaven, no one will. Oh, 
Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, the assumption that she's making is that I'm the one that's defective. Yeah. You know, so I was, I was trying to say, you know, maybe I'm the most spiritual one, right? Oh, well. But uh, uh, good, beautiful, beautiful sunset. I was thinking of you, Mitch. I was thinking, you get sunsets like that that look so nice, and they last till about 5.50 in the evening. What that means is you get to go back to work sometime soon. Amen? <laughs> a real positive thought, yeah. Uh, so praise the Lord for that. And, uh, beautiful time. Beautiful day to, yesterday uh, compared to the cold, cold that we had. A little bit warmer. We've got some cold days ahead of us, but um, always exciting uh, to see that. The only negative thing that happened to me this past week, you probably want to know, right? Well, okay, that was yeah. a few. Uh, is I, I, had, I went home. Uh, after work one day and rolled up like a scroll in between the door uh, jam and the front doorknob uh, was an invoice and it was for the propane. <laughs> that was the only thing negative that happened. <laughs> I thought, my goodness, how much can propane cost? Isn't it? Uh, well, I'm just playing. Uh, good to have you with us today. Good to have those that are joining us online. Always a wonderful thing. Um, uh, we had a number of people Wednesday night, many, many more than normal on Wednesday night, which I think has to do with the subject matter that we started last Wednesday. Uh, a lot of interest in that, so we're excited about that. Uh, where can I get a copy of God's Word? That's the question that was submitted to us, and that's what we've been doing on Wednesday nights is answering questions. We've done that for almost two years now. Uh, people keep asking questions, and we keep trying to answer them from the Bible. So. Uh, one of the questions that came in is, where can I get a copy of God's Word? And so we started last week, and we'll continue for probably the next six months or so, I guess. It's, that's a, a long answer to a short question, but we're going to do that. But it's good to have those that are joining us online. Um, we have people from all over the place, and it's uh, always encouraging to see them check in with us in uh, the morning for Sunday school. And it's good to have you with us as well. Uh, in Sunday school, we've been going through a uh, study on the number seven, the number seven. And we tried to do a few things as we've gone through this uh, for those, uh, uh, just by way of review, if you're with us for the first time online or otherwise, is that when we study the Word of God, rather than uh, find a book that someone else wrote and learn what they know, which is very dangerous, uh, and... Uh, we, we, we take this text, and uh, this is the one that's reliable, and we say, okay, well, how in the world do we study it? And so we come to what's called the first mentioned principle. Where's the first time that subject, that person's name, that place, that idea, where's the first time it shows up in the Bible? And God has this um, system, and this system is, is that usually the first place that it's used in the Bible will define how that word, place, person, or whatever is used through the entire Bible. And so we find the first mentioned principle of the number seven. We find it's Genesis chapter two, verses one and two. And if you're familiar with the passage, this is the creation of God on the seventh day he rested. And so after we look at it in the context of the verse and the chapter of which it was written, then we say, okay, let's make a summary statement just based upon our first impression. And we made the summary statement, the number seven has something to do with completion, being finished, and resting. We usually rest after we're done. Okay, so that, that's the concept that was given there. So once we make the summary statement of what we think it's, how it was used the first time it shows up, then from there what we do is uh, we check the Bible out to see if we can find that that summary statement is correct with the Word of God. And so, what we do is uh, we usually go from the first place, first time it showed up, and we look at every verse of Scripture in the Bible that has to do with the number seven. That's how we would normally do it. We're not doing that in this class because uh, I'm thanking you for giving me the benefit of the doubt that that summary statement is correct. Okay, So, we're going to see it through topics rather than through each time it shows up in the Bible. And we looked at the topic of resurrections. How many resurrections are there in the Bible? Seven. And then we looked at the subject of, of mer uh, mysteries. How many mysteries are there in the Bible? Okay. And then we looked at how many baptisms are there in the Bible. Okay. And then we looked 
and our now in ages and world. And we said those two words are used, world <laughs> referring to the end, and ages, periods of time within that, we call them dispensation. You can call them anything you want, periods of time. And uh, so then we looked at this seven, and we tried to say, uh, what's unique about seven? And what we came down is that God counts by sevens. We count by tens. Uh, and God, in case we forgot, gave us ten fingers and ten toes. And that, uh, so we can learn over and over again, we count by tens. But God counts by sevens. And after seven, he starts all over again. We go one, two, three, five, six, seven, ten. And then we start over, 11, 12, 13. Then we start over, 21, 20. Then we start over, 31. That's not how God counts. <clears throat> God counts by seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then he starts over again. And, he, and we see this everywhere. Uh, see it in music. There's seven notes. Anything other than a seventh note is a half note, but seven notes, and then it's octave up. Start with eight. Uh, we see it in colors. There's seven basic colors. Am I correct? Okay, we asked an artist. And then if you blend those covers, you, colors, you can get over 600 if you're really uh, real bright. Now, I, I can't see 600 colors. I, I can't see seven. Okay, so, <clears throat> but there's seven colors. When God does something, he does it by sevens. Doesn't matter if you're male, female, you have seven parts to the trunk. Doesn't matter. Seven. When God does something, he does it seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven openings in the head. God counts by sevens. He just and it becomes real obvious in nature, it becomes real obvious in a lot of different things. But it also becomes obvious when we look at God's word specifically that God hallows the seven, the seven. He hallowed the day, he hallowed the week, he hallowed the month, so there's seven days, there's seven weeks, there's seven months, there's seven years, there's seven groups of seven years, 49 years. Remember what happened on the 50th? Year of Jubilee. G year of Jubilee. <clears throat> if we count it <clears throat> by days, what happens on the 50th day after, it, it's Pentecost, okay? So, you, so God does these in sevens. He counts by sevens. And we talk then about moving to periods of time. When we look at periods of time in the Bible, or some people call them dispensations, but uh, we define a period of time or a dispensation <laughs> this way. A period of time when God has, is, or will, past, present, future, deal differently with humankind in how they relate to him. Periods of time. And then we look at <clears throat> there are seven, why would that surprise us? There are seven different periods of time in the Bible or dispensations. We have the dispensation of innocent, with innocence with Adam and Eve. We have that dispensation of consciousness. We have the dispensation of um, a government, human government. We have the dispensation of family. We have the dispensation of the law, the Ten Commandments. We have the dispensation that we are living in right now of grace, all right? And coming up next is the dispensation millennium of rest, the thousand-year millennial rest. And so there's seven dispensations. It all comes down. The Bible, when God counts, he counts by sevens, and then he starts all over again. If you go back to the book of Revelation, the last thing he talks about in chapter 21, or chapter 20 and 21, is the millennium. And then the next thing he talks about, there was a new heaven and a new earth. It's, it always works that way. Octave up, eight is the number of new beginnings. All right? And so uh, we looked at this, and we got this in our mind. If we looked at this as a calendar of beginning to the end, then we would take in between the dispensation of grace and the dispensation of the millennium, we would point an arrow saying this is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And when we talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ, there's two parts to that. One is our going to him, and two, him coming to earth. We re refer to it often as the rapture and the return of Christ. So the second coming has both of those events in that. <clears throat> and that would occur right there about where that arrow is, just before the millennium. Then from there we said it's important if we're going to study this number seven, and we're going to get the idea of what it's trying to communicate to us, that we also need to understand about scriptures. That scriptures have three 
applications to them. They have a historical, they have a doctrinal, and they have a spiritual application to them. The historical is, when you look at scripture, that was written at a specific period of time in history to a specific group of people. Doctrinally, it was written to address that specific group of people to tell them what they needed to do to relate correctly with God. And then application, there's a spiritual application of that. We talked about that last week. It's probably one of the easiest ones. Uh, Moses in uh, Numbers chapter 21 raised a pole in the wilderness to the nation of Israel because snakes were biting people and they were dying because they had sinned. And God said, you raise this pole, put a serpent on the top of it, made out of brass, and then tell the people when they get bit by the serpent, look to the pole and live. And they'd be healed. So come to the New Testament, Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Speaking of Jesus on the cross. All of a sudden, the parallel between those two events become astronomically interesting. Mm -hmm. When Moses lifted up the pole, we can look at all the events there in Numbers chapter 23, 24, and then look at the cross of Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden, it is amazing <laughs> what happens. Uh, the parallels that we would maybe not even see when we first read through Numbers, all of a sudden just come out in living colors. That's for you, Barb. <laughs> living colors, okay? Uh, as, as we see those things. All right, so three uh, approaches to Scripture. Anytime we read the Bible, we want to look for the historical setting. We want to look for the doctrinal application or, or uh, teaching. And then three, is there, is there a picture of that application spiritually to me? Now, the reason that that's important is because when we go to Hosea chapter 12, and verse 10 in our Bible, we find this very interesting thing. That God says when he wants to communicate his word by the prophets, one of the ways he's going to do it is through similitudes. Similitudes. Did I spell that right? Similitudes. I think so. Yeah. Uh, and if you say you don't know, then I'm home free, right? So the only one that could correct me is someone that knew that I was wrong, correct? All right. But <clears throat> similitudes. Similitudes in the Bible will always have one of these two words with them. Like or as. Like or as. And what that means is that if you can't understand a certain thing, God will say it's it's like that. And if you can understand that, then you can understand the spiritual concept. Or it's as that. Like or as. And those two words there speak to the similitudes. And the purpose of similitudes, don't miss this, is that's the way God communicates his word to us. Our we natural people. God's spiritual. How's he going to communicate his spiritual message to natural people? He's going to use the things that they can connect with naturally and illustrate it with a like or an as so we can understand spiritual things. Now, <clears throat> what I just gave to you there is, is a summary of uh, two and a half months. <laughs> okay, so, so now we've come down to it and uh, we're up to date. We've got the things that are before us. And I want to move forward because we were saying, okay, let's take this idea of the similitudes and let's look at some of them in the Bible so that we can become familiar with what a similitude is and how it's used. <clears throat> and how does it connect with seven? Well, guess how many similitudes there are that illustrate the second coming of Jesus Christ? Six. <laughs> There's always one, Mary Lane. Uh, there's always one. Seven. Seven similitudes in the Bible that speak of the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is amazing. Okay? So we looked at a couple last week. We're just going to review them quickly. One of them is found in Psalms 19. Psalms 19. Turn there if you would with me. Psalms 19. And look at this before our very eyes. Psalms 19. Good morning. Good morning. Psalms 19, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Psalms 19. Sarah, this morning we are looking at similitudes. Similitudes are, are defined in the Bible by like or as. And uh, we, since we're studying the number 7, we're looking at how many similitudes do we think 
God has in the Bible to speak to us about his second coming. You get a guess. Seven. Okay, all right, I was just checking. So seven of them, and the first one that we're looking at is found in Psalms 19, verses 1 through uh, 5. <clears throat> Notice what it says, And the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Whose voice is it? The heavens. Okay? They talk. They're to communicate. And look at verse 1. What are they to, to communicate to the world? The glory of God. They declare the glory of God. A person says, well, no one ever told me. <laughs> Do you have eyes? Have you ever woke up in the morning? Have you ever stayed awake beyond the sunset at night? The heavens declare the glory of God. They speak. They utter speech. And there isn't any language that it's not heard. It doesn't matter if it's English or if it's Japanese or whatever. It's, look at verse 3. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Everyone hears it. All right? And <clears throat> their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. What's, what did we say a tabernacle was according to the Bible? A body. Body. All right. We looked at the Old Testament tabernacle over here, uh, up here on the board, the Old Te Testament tag tabernacle. And it had a fence all the way around it, which is an illustration of the body. And then it had the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place inside it, another building. And we talked about that in a spiritual application <clears throat> of this. <clears throat> you have body, that's the fence around it. The holy place, the soul, the and the holy of holies, the spirit. Yeah. Body, soul, and spirit. Uh, that's all picture. Uh, that's the reason that <clears throat> the tabernacle, when we looked at it back in Exodus, why did God say to Moses that he was building that tabernacle? He wanted to dwell among men. And what's amazing about that is when we come to John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh, right? And what is the next word? And dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is a picture. This is a picture of Jesus Christ, body, soul, and spirit. And it is a picture of humankind when they are in relationship with God. We learned Wednesday, we just came through this on Wednesday night, that when God created Adam... And he, he created them body, soul, and spirit, a trichotomy. Body, soul, and spirit. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. He formed out the dust ground, breathed in his, breath, in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Body, soul, spirit. What happened is when they sinned, the Bible said if you eat the wrong thing, in the day that you eat there, you should surely die. die. Well, they had children after that, so it wouldn't die physically. What died? Spirit. spirit. Their spirit died. Uh, Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you have to be quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin. You have dead spirit. That's the reason when Jesus was confronted by Nicodemus, and Nicodemus wanted to puff him up and say, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, because no man could do the miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. I'm ready for you to say, I'm sure glad you have spiritual perception. Jesus didn't even pay any attention to what Nicodemus said. And he said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus didn't get it. He said, well, can a man enter his mother's womb the second time and be born? And Jesus said, no, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And then he talked about that. We're born in water, physical birth. And we're born in the spirit, spiritual birth. There's the two births that we have. And what happens is, Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, everybody says we're all born as children of God, but the Bible's real clear. Adam and Eve were born as children of God, but after he sinned and fell, in Genesis 5, verse 5, everyone was born in the image of Adam after the fall, not the image of God. And the image of Adam is a dead spirit. 
a dichotomy, body and soul, no spirit. That's the reason Jesus said, marvel not that I said it, you must be born again. Not of water, can't enter the second time in your mother's womb, be born. Spirit, got to be born again, spirit. Uh, God designed us to be body, soul, and spirit. When we sinned, after the similitude of Adam's sin, our spirit died, and it needs to be, say it with me, born again. <laughs> okay, born again, that's it. It needs to be born again. Going to church isn't going to help the problem. Giving money to the church isn't going to help the problem. Living the best way you can by the golden rule is not going to help the problem. The problem is birth. It isn't your behavior. It is birth. You must be born again. And so God created us to be a trichotomy. And when we accept Christ as our personal Savior, the Bible says he quickens us. He makes us alive. He gives us his spirit. And now we're a trichotomy again. And Paul alluded to that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, where he says, I pray your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved blameless under the coming of Jesus Christ. We're whole again. Body, soul, and spirit. Trichotomy. That's the tabernacle. Body, soul, and spirit. And so when we looked at that, we see this tabernacle is the body of something. So when we come back to Psalms chapter 19... And we look here in verse number four, their line has gone through, uh, gone out through all the earth, that's the heavens, and uh, their, their words to the end of the earth, they're declaring, it's everywhere, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. So he's saying that he made a body for the sun, S-U-N, a body for the sun. Now look at verse five. Which is, there's our word. Would we say a similitude we'll have with it? As. Like or as. And which is what? As this son, this S-U-N of verse 4, is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. What is Jesus coming back? He's going to have, at the millennium, he's going to sit down and have the marriage supper of the what? The lamb. the lamb. He's a bridegroom. What did Paul say? That he presented us to Christ. How did he present us? As a, As a bride. As a bride. So the bridegroom here, in this picture, uh, this says he prepared a tabernacle for the son, which is as a bridegroom. One of the similitudes that God uses about the second coming of Jesus Christ. When's the millennium going to happen? Second coming. One of the uh, uh, similitudes that God gives to us to illustrate the second coming of Jesus Christ is the S-U-N, the Son. That's a picture as a bridegroom coming. Um, in fact, uh, there's so much, and we spent a lot of time on this uh, week before last, that we're not going to go back through. But the sun is a picture of Jesus Christ. When it raises in the morning, it raises first what color? Red. When it sets in the evening, it sets in what color? Red. Uh, Jesus Christ shed his blood for us. All right? And uh, the sun has three rays. Three rays, isn't that surprising? A beta gamma and alpha rays. One of the rays you can see, but you can't feel. One of them you can feel, but not see. And the other one you can neither see or feel. Isn't that an interesting thing? The sun. You say, I got a good sun tan. We don't say, I got a good alpha tan. All right? Say, man, that sun feels warm. We don't say that's a good gamma, warm. We say that's good sun. Just like we say, when we say God is my Savior, who is actually our Savior through the Godhead is Jesus. We don't have to always try to separate the three any more than we have to separate the rays of the sun. When we say we got a sun tan, everybody knows that you got that from the sun. 
And we say, man, I got so warm sitting in my car because the was shining through the windshield. We say, what? The sun. All right. And man, it was so dark this morning, but all of a sudden, over the horizon, the came up. The sun. We say sun. It's the same thing. When we say God, you can mean God the Son, you can mean God the Spirit, you can mean God uh, the Holy Ghost. It, it, it's all the same. All right? God the Father. So, one of the similitudes that God uses in the Bible over and over and over again is the Son. It's interesting. Uh, uh, the Bible talks over there in Malachi chapter 4, the Son of Righteousness shall ride with healing. And then notice what it puts a pronoun there. With what? His healing. His. It's, it's an interesting thing. It says, attributes the Son as a masculine his. All right. Uh, the second one is the moon. The moon. Look at Job chapter 25. Job chapter 25. These, you, I'm going to re, remind you over and over again. Uh, I don't want to bore you to death, but why we're looking at this. We're looking at similitudes. Seven similitudes about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And one of them is the sun. The other one is the moon. Look at Job chapter 25 and verse number 5. Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. This is kind of an interesting thing here. Uh, we look at that, we read it, and go, ho oh, hum. But do you know how many years in the history of humankind that they didn't know that this, the moon didn't shine? We know that the moon doesn't shine, it reflects, right? But for years in science, no one knew that. They just assumed the sun, uh, I mean, the moon shone. Uh, in fact, they even wrote a song about it. Want me to sing it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> shine on, shine on.